All rise. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit is now in session. You may be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have three cases shown on the day sheet is submitted, and those are ordered submitted. We will commence with uh, the first case, which is Minier versus CIA. If I didn't pronounce that right, I hope you'll correct me. Good morning, Your Honor. David Minier, plaintiff appellant in pro se. <clears throat> If you it, don't object if I address you as a judge, surely, do you? Well, I'm, I'm here uh, well, strictly yeah, as a yeah. private citizen, so Your Honor. Right, but but uh, the trial judge is going to take all the precautions he can. <laughs> if it please the court, I'd like to set the stage for the legal discussion by referencing the factual background of the case briefly. Claude Barnes Capehart claimed to have been present with Lee Harvey Oswald at the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy in the capacity of a CIA employee. Capehart died seven years ago in 1989, and he was dead when I first made the Freedom of Information request. In 1992, Congress declared that the creation of a John F. Kennedy assassination archive was necessary because the Freedom of Information Act, as implemented by the executive branch, has prevented the timely disclosure of records relating to the assassination of President Kennedy. Congress also found that Executive Order 12356, upon which the CIA relies here in their claim of exemption, had been used by the government to prevent timely public disclosure of assassination records. Also in 1992, this court in Hunt versus CIA, which I'll be talking about more later, noted that the Freedom of Information Act has certainly not played a vital part in maintaining the American people's faith in their government, at least insofar as the CIA is concerned. Now, in response to the negative publicity, then director of the CIA, Robert Gates, publicly pledged to make the CIA more accountable and to make public all CIA records relating to the assassination of President Kennedy. And as indicated in our record, he made many statements assuring Congress and the American public of the openness and cooperation of the CIA. You know that no matter how many statements he, made, he may have made in that context, I mean, the issue is that whether or not there's a statutory exemption, right? Isn't that the issue here? Uh, not the only issue, Your Honor. The Isn't issue... That the primary issue? Well, what's the other issue? Well, the issue really is not a, what kind of public statement that the, the DCI made, is it? Well, Your Honor, I think it is, and, and this is the reason why I think it is, because even though there's an exemption, if there is bad faith conduct, that exemption can be disallowed, can be set aside by the district court, and the district court can order disclosure. What case you rely on for that proposition? Well, I believe that that is under the general standards for the appellate review or for the judicial review of federal agency decisions, federal agency conduct uh, you're under five, some, five... You're saying some j vague general standard of review permits this court to override a statutory exemption if it finds bad faith? Yes, Your Honor. I'm saying that under 5 U.S.C. 706, that the CIA's claim of exemption can be set aside as arbitrary, capricious, and an abuse of discretion, which is bad faith, and that then the district court can and should order disclosure. I think that's the protection that the uh, Congress put into the whole freedom of information uh, area so that a federal agency, whether it's freedom of information or any other administrative decision, a federal agency uh, can't just arbitrarily, with an abuse of discretion, make a decision and have it uh, withstand any court review. Well, that's a little different now from bad faith. I mean, it, 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 you know, you, but you can't cite a single case that uh, permits the setting aside of a statutory exemption from disclosure uh, on the basis of ba a finding of bad faith. Well, uh, Your Honor, uh, in Hunt versus CIA, which is relied upon by the government, 
bad faith wasn't even an issue. Yet the Ninth Circuit in Hunt versus CIA, they went out of their way to point out that the government has the burden. The government has the burden in justifying their claim of exemption to show that there is no contravening evidence in the record and to show there's no bad faith. That's, that's what the Ninth Circuit has said the governmental burden is. They have to show there's no ga bad faith in the record. But Hunt doesn't say that if bad faith is shown, I asked this question for the third time, that if bad faith is shown, the stat statutory exemption is, is, uh, doesn't apply. Well, I, I can't say any more than I did, uh, uh, Your Honor, other than, than citing the, the standards for the judicial review, and I think that's what it says, that, that the, the courts can set aside. In other words, I don't believe that a federal agency is totally immune in that they can make a decision in bad faith uh, with an abuse of discretion, capriciously, arbitrarily, and then sit back and say there's no judicial review. I think that's the whole purpose of the standards of review, that the court that, can't... That, that's different. In other words, the, from saying there's no review in the event of bad faith to say it might change the way we review it, I think it's a different question. And I think uh, Judge Tasima's question is, what case says, once bad faith is shown, uh, says that there is no uh, defense then on the part of the agency? I'm not sure there is a case that, that, that I believe that that's what the, uh, the section of the code says. That's what Congress enacted. And may, maybe there hasn't been a case uh, interpreting that. That's another that, way of saying that you don't have a spotted cow case. Isn't that what that means? Well, I, maybe that does. I'm not sure the government has a spotted cow case either, Your Honor. What, and, uh, that's, it seems to me that... Uh, on a simplistic look, this case isn't too complicated. So let's start with my simplistic look. Let's look at Section 403G. It says that uh, uh, the director of central and so the agency shall be exempted from the provisions of any law which requires the publication or disclosure of the organization, functions, or names of personnel employed by the agency. Now, in the Sims case, the uh, Supreme Court said that that statute, or its predecessor, was a, an Exemption 3 statute. So under the FOIA, this is an exemption from disclosure. So if we read Sims and that statute and, the, and Exemption 3 together, why doesn't that decide the case? Well, because I, in all due respect, Your Honor, I think this court is now asking questions as, as if you, you were the district court trying the case. We're up here on an appeal of a summary Wait, judgment. Is that what the district court said? Yes, I think the district oh, court said so it. I think the district so, so court I, was I, wrong. I think Judge Nelson's question then is, you know, why was that error? Because before the district court could properly grant the summary judgment, they had to have an adequate factual basis. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, there's an exemption and they can claim an exemption. There still has to be an adequate factual basis. What We've cited... What basis do you need to come within that statute? Aren't you asking for the name of someone and the function no, we, of that we have, someone? No, we have the name already, Your Honor. We were You're asking if that person is a, is a, was at that time an employee of the CIA, right? Basically, yes. And the, the statute says the agency doesn't have to provide, have to disclose the names of personnel of the agency. And you're asking them to do exactly that, aren't you? That's what we've asked them to do. So what, what factual required basis is required? Don't we know everything we need to know? Well, I, again, I, I, I hate to keep harping on it. The, uh, we're, we're here on a appeal of a summary judgment. I think that we have to look at the cases that relate to the kinds of affidavits that are required for summary judgment. I don't think you can do a summary judgment without affidavits. I don't think you can just do it out of the air by saying, well, there's a statute and you've asked for such and such. I think the summary judgment has to be based upon the, the affidavits. Now, we've tried to show that the affidavit in this case, the affidavit of Mr. Hatch, uh, which is the sole basis uh, upon which the CIA relies, as far as we can show, uh, we've tried to show that that 
is legally insufficient, and the Ninth Circuit has said so, that, that you can't just have a boilerplate conclusionary affidavit. That's what Hunt versus CIA said. That's what you said in Rosenfeld uh, less than a year ago. Hey, besides saying that, that uh, uh, you know, we don't disclose the names of employees. Well, what he's supposed to say, uh, Your Honor, I believe, is what the Ninth Circuit said in Hunt. They gave an example. They showed how there was a specific affidavit in Hunt, and they compared it with the affidavits in two other cases. I've cited these on page 20 of my brief. And, and they, they indicated that you can't just say in a conclusionary way, well, this, this is going to harm the national defense. We can't give out names because it will harm things. The, all he has to say is, you know, we're not going to, uh, uh, the applicant wants us to disclose whether uh, a certain person was employed by the CIA. The CIA doesn't disclose names. Well, in all due respect, that's not what Hunt said, I, I don't well, believe. That's, uh, that's what the affidavit said, the Hatch affidavit. Right? Yes, but it's conclusionary. That, that's my point, Your Honor. It is nothing but a boilerplate how conclusionary. Could more, how, how could it be more factual? It could, as, uh, for example, the one that is in Hunt that they approved, the, the two specific uh, uh, affidavits that they referred to in Hunt in other cases that they approved, that was the Miller case and the Gardell's case, they gave examples of where there were, there were specific details given of just how the requested information could harm the national security. Here, well, but, but in this case, there's a, as Judge Nelson says, there's a specific statutory exemption that says that the agency need not disclose the names of its employees. Right? It, it, there's a specific well, statute. It, it, so it, all, all he has to say is, uh, we don't disclose the names of employees. I mean, he doesn't have to make a showing of harm to the national security. It's in the statute. Well, I think that same argument was, was made in, in Hunt. And in Hunt, in analyzing it, they indicated that isn't all you have to, to do. They indicated that you have to have specific non-conclusory affidavits. They in, also added that the CIA well, has the well, burden. They rely on the statute that was this specific, did it? Well, but well, I think first it, of all, Hunt didn't involve the CIA, right? I, I believe it's Hunt versus CIA, Your Honor. Yeah, CIA. It, it didn't involve the statute, did it? Well, it involved one of the, the exemption statute, but I, I think the same applies no matter which of the exemptions you're talking about. But wasn't, I, that the, wasn't Hunt the, the question was whether uh, it caused damage to the national security within the executive order, not whether the foreign national was an employee of the CIA. Well, but by the, the reasoning of the CIA, they're all combined, I think, into the same thing. They say that basically that any revelation of any information about any contact with CIA, this is their Glomer, Glomer response, where they say we always have to say we cannot confirm or deny, because if we say anything, it indirectly can, can harm the, the national security and the national Not defense. The proposition that if that's the position of the CIA, you're, the court's entitled to, to look at it. In other words, the CIA can't give, as you say, a boilerplate response. Here, where, the, where what you want is whether the man was an uh, employee of the CIA and what his functions were, all the CIA has to do is bring itself within the plain words of the statute, isn't it? Well, that's, that's not the way I interpret it, Your Honor. Well, how do you get around it? In other words, your first answer to my question was that the affidavit was inadequate. All the CIA has to say is, look, here's the statute, and we don't release the names of people as being yes or no personnel of the CIA. That's our policy, and these are the reasons. Why isn't that enough? Because I think if there are allegations, if there's any evidence of bad faith, as we've indicated there is here, that it's the burden, as Hunt points out, on the CIA that they, they have to show that there is no bad faith. They, they have to show that there's no evidence of bad faith in the record. And here they've been virtually silent on that. The affidavit of Mr. Hatch didn't even refer to it. it well, it's I don't know uh, what Mr. Hatch could say other than we're not in bad faith. But as I read your brief, you seem to say that the delay is the bad faith. It took two years for them to reject your appeal. Uh, do you have anything else that you argue is bad faith? Well, I think that's, that's enough, Your Honor. It's not only two and a half years during that period of time, at the same time that the CIA was making all of these public proclamations about openness, 
Uh, at the same time, three United States senators uh, inquired in writing of the CIA what they were doing with my appeal, and as early as 1992, the CIA started disingenuously advising in writing those three United States senators that they were actively working on my appeal, when of course it was a foregone conclusion, the appeal would be denied. There was any, never any question about that. I, yes, I, I think that, that in the context, the delay when they're assuring senators they're working on it, which they weren't, when they're assuring Congress and the public that they're open in all these matters related to the JFK assassination, yes, I, I think that two and a half year delay definitely is bad faith. The only reason they finally decided it well, I shouldn't say that, but they did finally decide the appeal and deny it only after I filed this action. And, and query if I had not filed the action, would they still actively be working on it, unquote, uh, today? Well, let's say that, that uh, absent bad faith, that we look at the statute, we look at, at the Hatch affidavit and say, all right, the CIA has brought itself within the statute, absent bad faith. That would be our conclusion. Now, what does bad faith do to that? Do we simply wipe off the uh, finding that the CIA is within the statute? Or do we review I, it differently? Or do we send it back to the district well, court? I, I believe you send it back to the district court because I believe first the district court did not have the adequate factual basis because I, I don't think, I think the net effect of the Hatch Declaration was zero because it was conclusory. But added to that, you had the bad faith evidence of the delay in the context I mentioned. And the district court judge simply disregarded that on the basis of a letter, not an affidavit. He disregarded it on the basis of a letter. So it, I, I think it should be sent back to the district court judge so that he would properly consider the, the bad faith and, and require some kind of a proper affidavit from the CIA. What would that affidavit say? I think it would have to give some specificity as to how divulging whether or not the records of Claude Barnes Capehart, not just anybody, but whether divulging if their employment records of Claude Barnes Capehart would uh, be detrimental to the national securities. Maybe Mr. Capehart simply was a laborer on the Glomer Explorer ship. Uh, if that's the case, I, I don't see how they can justify it's going to endanger the national security. So in other words, instead of reading the statute the way it reads, the court has to look at, take one more step and say, in spite of the fact the statute says the agency doesn't have to provide names of personnel, that means the names of personnel, when doing so, would endanger the national security. Is that what the court would have to find? I would think the court would have to, to make a finding based upon an affidavit that gives some specific detail as to how the national security will be harmed. I think the court would have to have that in order to, to find an adequate basis for the summary judgment motion. That sort of wraps Exemption 3 into Exemption 1, doesn't it? I think they're all wrapped up together as far as what's, what's required. I, I think that the government, uh, whether it's Exemption 1 or 3, I think they have to justify it uh, what's with specificity. Your, what's your statutory text in support of your statement that Exemption 3 doesn't mean what it says. As I read it, all it means, says is there has to be a statute which exempts the agency from making the disclosure. Isn't that what Exemption 3 says? I believe it does. All right. So and as I read uh, 403G, it says flatly the agency doesn't have to provide the functions and names of agency personnel. All right. What's the statutory text for requiring a further step? Well, the... Your Honor, there is no more statutory text requiring a further step than there is a statutory text for the near exemption by the, the judicial branch of the CIA from the FOIA. I think this is, we're talking about judicial decisions. Uh, there's, there's nothing in the statute saying CIA is exempt. But as pointed out in Hunt, in the Hunt case, they were just one step away from judicially establishing a total blanket CIA exemption from the FOIA. There's no statutory authority for that either. But I think we're really in the realm of, of the, the case decisions more than we are in the congressional acts. Except that, that it seems to me that the names of personnel is a blanket exemption. If you look at subject matter, the names and function of personnel are, are dealt with differently. Well, 
Yes, it would appear that way, except for the, the case decisions regarding the bad faith and the requirement of the, of the non-conclusory affidavits. I, I, I think it's been taken a long, long way from the statutes. I think the courts have taken it there. And what, where I think you are now, Your Honor, is you're, you're, you're on the brink. You're on the brink of a total exclusion of the CIA from the Freedom of Information Act. And I, I think that the court should take a long look and step back from that decision because I, I think that if, if the court grants the, uh, or goes ahead and upholds the summary judgment motion, that what you've done is you've completed the total emasculation of the Vaughn versus Rosen, the idea that there should be some form of discovery. And I think what the, the court will have done is, is continued and finally granted the CIA a total exemption from the Freedom of Information Act, which I don't think is the, uh, is the will of Congress or, or what was intended for the American but, public. But as to functions and names of, of your parade of horrible consequences, isn't that what Congress has done? I mean, the court hasn't said anything about functions and names. That's what Congress said. Well, I don't know. In, in Hunt, the, uh, the, the court said now it's up to Congress, in effect, to undo what we've done as far as the total exemption. So I guess maybe Congress is looking to the courts and the courts are looking to Congress. I don't know. A weak read on both ends? Pardon me? A weak read on both ends? <laughs> I, I don't know. Mayor, I think, I, you know, I understand your frustration uh, with this process. And uh, I think you read Hunt correctly that uh, the CIA does have a near total exemption, a blanket exemption. Uh, and Hunt does say, you know, maybe Congress should do something about it. But uh, one, it's not, you know, it's not going to do you, I tell you, much good to send it back to the district court. You know, I've conducted these kinds of trials. They're sort of like ex parte. You, you'll get to sit here in, in the courtroom while the U.S. attorney goes back into the chambers with the judge and they talk about the case and they'll come out and tell you what the ruling is. But uh, you, you see, I, I think the problem, the problem with your position is that, as far as I can tell from Hunt. The only consequence of, well, first of all, the general rule is that uh, the, uh, the, the CIA affidavit is to be given a substantial deference. So the only consequence I can see from uh, a, a finding of bad faith is there is no substantial deference paid, maybe, all right? But uh, even so, you get back to Judge Nelson's question, the only, it seems to me the only fact that the CIA has to establish is that you're seeking to know whether a person was an employee. I mean, that bad faith doesn't enter into that at all. I mean, that's a simple, I don't think you even contest that that's what you're seeking, right? Uh, so, I mean, wh 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 bad faith doesn't seem to do anything for you. I mean, suppose district court found bad faith. It would still have to find that what you're seeking is, is, is to establish whether or not a certain person was an employee of the CIA. And the statute said you can't have that. But, but I... Isn't that as simple as that? Well, no, Your Honor, respectfully, I, I think that if the, CA, if the uh, district court finds bad faith, the district court then can go ahead and set aside the claim of exemption. In other words, it, I think the idea is that if bad faith has produced the claim of exemption, the remedy is to disallow the claim. At least that's the way I, I understand the, the, the standards. I think I've overrun my time. Your Honor, thank you very much. We'll give you a minute in rebuttal. Thanks. Thank you. You may proceed. May it please the Court, I am Camille Skipper, Assistant U.S. Attorney here on behalf of the Central Intelligence Agency. I'm prepared to address any issues that the court believes would be helpful in resolving this appeal. I plan to address uh, Exemption 3, seen as the court appears most interested in it, as well as the claims of bad faith <coughs> the, um, and the applicability of the JFK Records Act. Isn't the Exemption 3 the cleanest approach to it? Yes, because it does not require the court to enter into ana ana an analysis of whether or not um, disclosure of this information would in any way damage or harm the national security. Exemption 3, using 403G, as the court has already noted, um, is the cleanest because it does not require the court to enter into any analysis. It's clear on its face that these sort, this sort of information is protected from disclosure. In fact, it requires a CIA um, director to 
protect this information. So while the exemption itself is not mandatory, 403G is. As far as appellant's claims of bad faith in this case, the CIA would respectfully submit that there has been no valid claim of bad faith. Bad faith, as it has been understood in the case law, is regards the CIA or other agencies' failure to make an adequate search for records. In this case, there can be no inadequate search for records because the, the existence of records itself is deemed classified. If, if I can pick up on Judge Tatima's uh, remark, you didn't go into the chambers with Judge Burrell, did you? Not yet. <laughs> No, Your Honor, I did not. Okay. I just wanted to have that on the record. Thank you, ma'am. Although I, I feel compelled to note that a document was filed under seal in this case. I was not the attorney on the case at the, time, at the district court level, although I do know a document was filed under seal. I don't know what the contents of that document are. Different from the Hatch Declaration? Yes, Your Honor. Although the court, the district court does not appear to have relied upon that document in deciding its, in making its decision, and the CIA would, um, and the CIA would suggest that it didn't have to. The public declaration is sufficient to make a, uh, to grant summary judgment in this case. So I take it when the government uh, files a document under seal, they don't even tell their lawyers what's in it. A few lawyers can it's know. It's hard to litigate, doesn't it? Not really in this case, because the document we would contend is unnecessary to the, to, to, to the district court's decision. The Hatch Declaration, the public declaration, is more than sufficient, more than um, adequate to form a factual basis for the grant of summary judgment. What's the, you're saying though, in this case, if bad faith is limited to an inadequate ref, uh, search for documents, since there is no search for documents required here, there can be no bad faith. That's correct, Your Honor. So if it took the CIA 10 years to make a decision on the appeal, that, uh, that's just the way it goes. Well, if it takes the CIA 10 years to make a decision on appeal, some responsibility rests with the, the plaintiff because the plaintiff has the right, after 20 days, to file a district court action. That is the remedy for um, an appeal that takes too long. In this case, a plaintiff or appellant here waited two years and three months to file his case. Well, it doesn't really sit very well for the CIA to complain they weren't sued sooner, does it? <laughs> no, certainly, Your Honor, but we would say that the plaintiff has a remedy if the CIA takes too long. The CIA had a backlog of approximately 400 appeals at the time this appeal was filed. And the appellant was notified of that at the time his appeal was accepted. It was in progress for two and a, two and a half years until it came, until it was actually decided. But almost all of these so-called appeals are, they're denials, right? And many of them are, I'm sure, very, very simple denials like his. Well, we don't even tell you whether we have those records or not. That shouldn't take very long. The CIA... Seems to me, an experience analyst would go through a hundred of those a day. Well, CIA has a first-in, first-out policy. So that they, in some, in some appeals, um, require more time. Now, if there were appeals ahead of um, the appellants, which I assume there were, that required a greater amount of scrutiny, then his appeal is going to take longer to address. But he certainly had a remedy in filing a suit in district court, which he did three months before the appeal was finally decided. And I would clarify for the court that you know, although it's not particularly relevant in this case, a finding of bad faith would not require the disclosure of information. A finding of bad faith would, would only allow some discovery as to the issue of bad faith, as to the issue of the adequacy of the search, if the district court found that the agency's bad faith conduct sufficiently impugned the integrity of the declaration. And as the court has already noted, in this case, it's simply a legal issue. It is asking for the employment status of an individual, which the agency cannot disclose under Section 403G. What, is, uh, 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 what do you believe the proper remedy is uh, if court should find bad faith? 
then the court should remand the case to the district court to determine if the district court finds bad faith. Then the district court can allow discovery as to the issue of bad faith. And if the bad faith is found, then it can require the CIA or any agency to engage in the second search for documents and to provide a more adequate uh, affidavit. The, uh, one issue that seems to be a legal issue that seems to be open here still is uh, uh, the extent to which, if at all, the President Kennedy Assassination Records Act uh, <coughs> Uh, does or was intended to uh, create some kind of a separate exemption uh, or, or, or to, uh, to negate certain exemptions under the FOIA, right? Isn't that one of the issues raised by the plaintiff in this case? It's an issue raised by the appellant, but it's an issue that has been addressed in Assassination Archives and Research Center v. Department of Justice, which is a 1995 D.C. Circuit decision. In that decision, the D.C. Circuit held that these are two separate statutes. They didn't overlap in no way, and that you cannot use the standards for disclosure available in the JFK um, Records Act when you're discussing a FOIA exemption. And as well, they have two separate enforcement procedures, one which cannot be grafted onto the other. So, so it's your position that that, uh, that act is a, a independent, separate, standalone act and doesn't affect uh, any of the exemptions under the FOIA? That was the holding of the D.C. Circuit, and it certainly is the, the position that we would press here. And that's, a, at, that's the government's position that that case is correctly decided? Yes, and that it is irrelevant to, these, to the issues in this case. If the appellant wants records under the JFK Records Act, he needs to request those from the archives. That's a separate procedure. There's no re direct request made to any agency for records under the JFK Records Act. Here, the, the FOIA has a separate procedure as well as direct enforcement in the courts. And that is not available under the JFK Records Act. Appellant also raised the question of um, the Hunt Declaration not addressing bad faith. And we would simply note for the court that ha no real issue of bad faith having been raised in this case, the Hunt Declaration was not required to address it. The Hatch? Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. the Hatch Declaration. And I would also bring to the court's attention Lewis v. IRS at 823 F. 2nd, 375, which is a 1987 Ninth Circuit decision in which the court held in a somewhat analogous situation that a Vaughn index would not be required because the entire class of documents then at issue was exempt from disclosure. And that's just the sort of situation we have here where we're talking about employment records, an entire um, uh, type of documents which is not permitted to be disclosed, so you cannot have any more particularized statement. And I would also um, um, note for the court that any more particularized statement in the Hatch Declaration would reveal the very information that the CIA claims cannot be disclosed. That is the, exist the mere existence of the records or non-existence of those records. In this case, you have a very particularized declaration which states with um, with, with great particularity, uh, the ways in which release of this information could harm the national security, which would support both an Exemption 3 and Exemption 1 argument, Except the Exemption 3 argument being under 403-3C5, which protects intelligence methods and sources. Did you cite the Lewis versus IRS case in your brief? No, Your Honor. I'm sorry, we did not. Well, you can get a supplemental uh, authority sheet from the clerk and, and give that to us and counsel uh, so we'll be sure we wrote it down right, or that you did. Certainly. And I would also provide some statutory authority uh, with Baker v. CIA, another D.C. Circuit decision, which states ex exactly what this court stated earlier, that 403G does not require any um, second step. There need not be a showing of nexus between the disclosure of employment records 
and the uh, damage to national security. Those, there is no need for that type of showing under 403G. And I would include that in, um, in a supplemental site to the court. For the court. If the court has no further questions, I am prepared to submit the matter. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Yes. We're prepared to submit, Your Honors. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate counsel's assistance. The case just argued will be submitted, and we will take about a five-minute recess to allow uh, C-SPAN to disengage. Thank you. All right. A decision in the case you've just been watching, Muneer versus the CIA, is expected within the next few months. Coming up next week, a look back at the case Miranda versus Arizona, decided by the Supreme Court 30 years ago this month. From this case came the Miranda warnings, a set of four particular constitutional rights that police officers are required to tell.